Joshua called together all the tribes of Israel and Shechem. He called in the elders, chiefs, judges, and officers. They presented themselves before God. Then Joshua addressed all the people. I handed you a land for which you did not work, towns you did not build, and here you are now living in them and eating from vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. So now fear God. Worship him in total commitment. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worshipped on the far side of the river, the Euphrates, and in Egypt. You worship God. If you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then choose a God you'd rather serve and do it today. Choose one of the gods your ancestors worshipped from the country beyond the river or one of the gods of the Amortes on whose land you are now living. As for me and my family, we'll worship God. The people answered, We'd never forsake God, never. We'd never leave God to worship other gods. God is our God. He brought up our ancestors from Egypt and from slave conditions. He did it all those great things while we watched. He has kept his eye on us all along the roads we've traveled and among the nations we've passed through. Just for us, he drove out all the nations, Amortes, and all who lived in the land. Count us in. We, too, are going to worship God. He's our God. Good morning. Good morning. It works in the second service, too. <laughs> I'm surprised at how many churches I go to. I say good morning. They say nothing back. <laughs> it's good to be here. And uh, while I have been in worship here on several occasions, it's been a long time since I've preached. So that may mean that I haven't taken or had the opportunity to formally thank you for our continuing partnership in ministry. And I don't want you to think that I take that for granted. It's important to have a strong progressive voice here in Johnson County, and right now, you are the only UCC church in the Kansas City area in Kansas, Oklahoma Conference. I am both painfully aware of that because so many of our churches here have closed, and I am deeply grateful for who you are and your ministry here. But it makes your ministry that much more crucial because when someone is looking for a UCC church, in the conference in this area, I am sending them to you. And I know that I can send them here with confidence because you are strong partners with us in the conference and the wider church as you embody the core values of our denomination of extravagant welcome, a commitment to justice, and living our faith in our communities and in the world. We do that part, we live that partnership in many ways, but I want to thank you especially for your financial support of our church's wider mission, OCWM. How many of you know what that is? If you do, raise your, oh good, there are quite a few hands going up. But for those of you who don't, those are the dollars that congregations give, that you give to support the ministry of the United Church of Christ in this conference and beyond. Your dollars help support annual meeting planning and stewardship seminars and work with search committees, our German partnership, planning for national and regional youth events, and the list goes on and on. Part of your OCWM dollars are sent far beyond the Kansas-Oklahoma Conference to the national UCC offices to support an even wider witness of the United Church of Christ. Last September, I was among 22 conference ministers who traveled to Washington, D.C., where we collectively made over 40 visits to lawmakers to advocate for around the topic of immigration. As partners, this local church, led by Diane Kuhn, sent over 40, sent over 200 letters 
calling for humane treatment for immigrants, especially for children. Thank you, thank you for that kind of partnership and that kind of response. We delivered those letters to Congress when we made visits to the, uh, to the offices. Your voices matter. And we said that it matters how children are treated. It matters, in, even in Kansas, we don't appreciate, we don't support how some children are being treated. Our, how we treat our neighbors matters. This entire effort was supported by our office in DC. Again, this is your OCWM dollars at work. I could go on and on about how your OCWM dollars are used, but I want, what I want you to hear most of all is thank you. Thank you for your support financially. Our books are closed on 2019, and our records indicate that we received $19,700, a little less than 2018, but we continue to be grateful for your support and partnership, and we look forward to the ways that will continue and grow even stronger in the months ahead. Now, some of you may know that I don't put preaching at the top of the list of God-given gifts to me. So when Aaron told me he was doing a series on the Joshua generation, and I should use a text from Joshua, the words he heard from me were, okay, but deep down I was thinking, oh, great. <laughs> because the book of Joshua isn't exactly what a person who isn't a real preacher likes to hear when they know they're going to have to craft a sermon. And if you've ever read the book of Joshua, you probably know what I mean. It isn't a pretty sight. It's not exactly what I would call an image of God that is uplifting and encouraging. But one thing it does do, and that is emphasize that Joshua was a faithful and determined leader. And the text that was read is one that you might recognize. Joshua is at the end of his life and he has gathered the community and recounted all that they have been through together. Now, I spared you much of the reading of the details, but in short, he tells them all he has done, and they are living on lands they didn't work for and towns they didn't build. They're eating food from vineyards they didn't plant. And being a man of God, he tells them it is time for them to decide for themselves who they will worship. And then he makes this declaration. He says, for me and my family, we will worship God. You may know it in its more familiar recitation. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now that's a pretty clear declaration for a man dying to speak for subsequent generations of his family. And so as I began to think about what it means in relationship to the Joshua generation that Aaron has been focusing on and where we are in our country, I began to wonder, what does it mean for one generation to speak for another generation? Does serving God change based on a certain time or on the generational differences? Does it change or does God change? Might it mean that one generation got something wrong in the first place and the subsequent generation is charged with correcting it? That's going to go over really well, isn't it? But you know, these are very real questions that we are grappling with. We may not frame them as questions between the Moses generation and the Joshua generation, but in some ways they are. You don't need me to stand up here and quote the statistics to you. My guess is that you have read them or heard them somewhere. The differences in ages on how a certain topic is viewed, go to or you can go to the fount of all wisdom yourself. Just Google it. And you will see the divide on almost any given topic. The breakdown is pretty much clearly on age. Now, I could delve into this uh, more deeply with you on a wide range of concerns, but we ha don't have all morning. We're not Baptist. <laughs> so I had to pick one. And because it's Black History Month, and because I like to pick the easy topics, I picked race. I mean, what can be easier than the African American conference minister speaking in a predominantly white congregation about race, right? <laughs> but I am who I am, and you are who you are, and we are in this together. And together we are experiencing the reality 
of what the Joshua generation has brought to our country, and that is redefining the conversations that we need to have about race. And one thing about Joshua, he was faithful, he was relentless, and sometimes the result was brutal and painful. Now, I thought I was gonna do something pretty radical here, and that was tell you my age. But I see you guys are pretty used to talking about age. <laughs> uh, you're pretty revealing about age here. I was born in 1953, so I am <clears throat> 66. See, I thought I was gonna form a special bond with you by revealing my age. <laughs> you don't have to tell me your age, but for me, this was a generation where I was being taught that color made no difference. We were aiming for a colorblind society. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Raise your hands if that's what you were being taught when you were growing up, okay. We were aiming for a country where color made no difference. That's what my parents told me, and that's what I, and by the show of hands, many of you grew up with as well. And so we didn't see color, although we all kind of knew that wasn't true. I knew I was the only black child in my class, and I knew that I was representing the entire African-American population every time I spoke. And I knew that even though color made no difference, that discrimination against African-Americans was real. But I didn't know how to frame it or reconcile it with the words of my parents that color made no difference. I didn't know then that they meant that my race didn't limit me or define me, because they knew that in every segment of their lives that their color had indeed made a difference in the quality of their lives. Indeed, it had limited them in education, in choice of jobs, you name it, color had made a difference for them. But you know, yeah, you know, I'm not white. So I can't speak for any of you who grew up with the perspective and goal of living in a colorblind society. Were you not taught to see color? You were taught also not to see color, so I can't speak to that. But I have to wonder, did you really not see color? Did you, but did you hold certain ideas about persons of color? Let's, let's watch a first clip. So it's 2006. My friend Harold Ford calls me. He's running for US Senate in Tennessee. And he says, Melody, I desperately need some national press. Do you have any ideas? So I had an idea. I called a friend who was in New York at one of the most successful media companies in the world. And she said, why don't we host an editorial board lunch for Harold? You come with him. Harold and I arrive in New York. We are in our best suits. We look like shiny new pennies. And we get to the receptionist and we say, we're here for the lunch. She motions for us to follow her. We walk through a series of corridors. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a stark room, at which point she looks at us and she says, where are your uniforms? <laughs> Just as this happens, my friend rushes in. The blood drains from her face. There are literally no words, right? And I look at her and I say, now, don't you think we need more than one black person in the US Senate? Now, Harold and I, we still laugh about that story. And in many ways, the moment caught me off guard. But deep, deep down inside, I actually wasn't surprised. Colorblind, not really. There were some perspectives in that person's mind when she saw a person of color about what that meant. That image, that idea of being colorblind, still lives on in the minds and, yes, in the hearts of some. So what does it really mean, and is it really real? Let's continue on with the second clip. You see, 
Researchers have coined this term color blindness to describe a learned behavior where we pretend that we don't notice race. If you happen to be surrounded by a bunch of people who look like you, that's purely accidental. Now, color blindness, in my view, doesn't mean that there's no racial discrimination and there's fairness. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't ensure it. In my view, color blindness is very dangerous because it means we're ignoring the problem. There was a corporate study that said that instead of avoiding race, the really smart corporations actually deal with it head on. They actually recognize that embracing diversity means recognizing all races, including the majority one. But I'll be the first one to tell you, this subject matter can be hard, awkward, uncomfortable, but that's kind of the point. See, colorblindness isn't real and it doesn't work. We all see color, even if we don't name it. But the Joshua generation and those after are calling us to something new. They're calling us to a new paradigm about race, and it's shaking the foundation for many, even in our own congregations. A new paradigm of truth-telling, even with just words and language. Many in our churches, even our very progressive UCC congregations, don't like the word white supremacy. They don't like the words white fragility or white privilege. After all, many are people who have been on the right side of justice. And this is often really hard stuff to hear. There is resistance and bafflement about tearing down monuments that recognize our heritage. And the conversations about reparations is fraught with all kinds of difficulties, even from the most generous, committed, and progressive people of faith. I can imagine that some are thinking like Joshua. Here we have given you all of this. We marched, we fought for civil rights, for equal rights, and now you're saying we were wrong? You want us to see color? You want us to celebrate differences? What happened to all of us being, well, just Americans? It's hard for some to understand that I can be an African American and feel the pain of the history of this country that continues toward African Americans and name it, and still be proud to be an American and call this country and to do and be better. Yes, the Joshua generation has started us down a different road. Let's play the last clip. In the spirit of debunking racial stereotypes, the one that black people don't like to swim, I'm gonna tell you how much I love to swim. I love to swim so much that as an adult, I swim with a coach. And one day my coach had me do a drill we had to swim to one end of a 25-meter pool without taking a breath. And every single time I failed, I had to start over. And I failed a lot. By the end, I got it, but I got out of the pool, I was exasperated and tired and annoyed. And I said, why are we doing breath-holding exercises? And my coach looked at me and he said, Melody, that was not a breath-holding exercise. That drill was to make you comfortable being uncomfortable, because that's how most of us spend our days. If we can learn to deal with our discomfort and just relax into it, we'll have a better life. So I think it's time for us to be comfortable with the uncomfortable conversation about race. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, male, female, all of us. If we truly believe in equal rights and equal opportunity in America, I think we have to have real conversations about this issue. We cannot afford to be colorblind we have to be color brave. What if part of what it means to serve God today means being color brave? Let's not fool ourselves. Just because we are members of the United Church of Christ or in a progressive church doesn't mean that we all get it and that we get a pass as having arrived. The UCC is a diverse denomination, and I can assure you that there are people in every single one of our congregations that will take issue with what I have said today or 
about race or that I will ever say about race. Believe me, I know. <laughs> and you know what? That's okay. Because the important thing for me is that we become communities of faith, that we are brave enough to have the conversations about race. We don't all have to agree because that's not what our faith, what our community is built on. It's not built on all being in agreement. The important thing is that we no longer pretend that it doesn't matter, that we no longer try and cover it up or play the hush-hush game. What if I were more brave about race? I wonder sometimes about the woman who said to me that I wasn't just a token, that I was really good. I wonder how many other people of color she has offended out of her ignorance. My guess is she didn't intend to be offensive. She thought she was giving me a compliment. What if I had said something about that to her? said it very kindly and lovingly, because you know what? Nobody wins by blasting someone. That simply shuts down the conversation. But what if I had said something to her about why that was offensive? Maybe that would have prevented her from saying something like that to someone else. Maybe she would have grown to that as a result of that. So perhaps, I could have been more brave as well. So see, I'm not pointing the finger at you to say you need to be more brave. We all perhaps need to be more brave. No one here has the market on having arrived. You know, I picked race today, but really I could have written a similar sermon about any number of things this morning because the central question is what it means to say as for me and my house, we will serve God. Does Joshua get to define what that means for all generations, even of his own lineage? While it is hard for me to believe that there was ever a time where people actually believed that slavery was right and condoned by God, I know that there was. There were people by the thousands, churches, who stood firm for slavery. Now, it is hard for many of us to understand denominations that don't ordain women. And we know that there are churches, denominations, that think it's just fine to ostracize and marginalize people based on their sexual orientation. And there are Christians who think it's just fine to house migrant children in detention centers. After all, their parents should have never been coming here illegally in the first place. Are these people serving God? They think they are. How do we know that we are serving God when we are in such different places? Is it generational? I think we can take a piece of what Aaron said last week. Is it on the side of mercy? Is it on the side of justice? As for me and my house, we will serve God. It's a broad and a bold statement by Joshua made at a certain time in the universe, one that he really had no power to assure would be lived out, at least not in the way he might think or expect. I asked the question earlier if what it means to serve God changes. Or did those who have gone before us just get it wrong? Or if Joshua got it wrong? I really don't think that what it means to serve God has changed. I think people have always interpreted that in ways that were convenient for them. But if I apply that question to the question of race, I think yes. I think we got it wrong about being a colorblind society. We got it wrong because it was easier to do and say than face the reality and the horror of slavery and the dominance of one group over another. It was easy than, admit, than to admit that perhaps black people had value and were equal to white people because that would debunk white supremacy and that was and is the basis of our entire social construct. But more importantly for all of us here this morning, I think it was wrong because it denied the fullness of God's creation. But as usual, 
Something that isn't real doesn't endure. And the time is now, the time to write a new story, a new narrative, a more faithful and a braver one. It's time for us to set aside being color colorblind and take a step into being color brave. It's a courageous journey. It will be a hard journey. I invite you to join me, step by step. Amen.